Hi guys, thanks for joining me once again. This is Peter, you're watching Thailand Bound, and if it's your first time here, I talk about all things Thailand. Right, my prayers have been answered. Well, not exactly, not my prayers. Do you remember I put out a shout out? I said, if there's any Western women out there who've been to Thailand and had relationships with Thai guys, because we've never read one out before, uh, and I was kind of struggling, nobody got back to me. I've, I've had one, I've actually had one, I've got one. And it's gonna be the first story that I'm gonna read out to you today. This is sent in to me from a lady from the UK. She was about 35 years old at the time. I've changed all the names as always, so I don't wanna waste any time, guys. I'm gonna get straight into this and let's see how we get on with this one. I arrived on one of the small islands in Thailand in 2014 from England via Australia, South Pacific and New Zealand. I am dual British and American and had lived all my life in England and at the age of 35 was having a bit of a midlife crisis. I landed a job in one of the diving operations managed by a German woman in her early mid-30s named Emilia. She had been to Thailand for a few years after her career in Germany working as a teacher and then like many others got bored and wanted to try something new out in a faraway place. After only a few days working here, I noticed that Amelia had a rather hands-on way of working with her male staff. Both for Lang and Thai, that would have been considered unprofessional and inappropriate in, the mo in most Western workplaces. One evening, after several vodka and Red Bulls, Amelia confided in me that she was terribly infatuated with a young Thai man who had done some work for her on her boat. One huge problem. This boy happened to be the fiancé of a Thai woman whose family was fairly well connected on the island. I tried to warn her, dissuade her from continuing this because only bad things can come from these sorts of indiscretions. Not too long before this, a Dutch woman had to flee the island on a night ferry after hiding out in the bushes because she'd upset a jealous local with similar sexual indiscretions. Amelia had thrown caution to the wind and was convinced nothing bad was going to happen. Some Farangs were convinced they were invincible, only or untouchable, because they felt their foreign status would protect them and others had the attitude that if you didn't acknowledge a problem, then that said problem didn't exist. Several months went by and Amelia's business was struggling due to the combination of low season with particularly bad weather. Her lack of business knowledge and her continuing hang-ups with the men in her surroundings. Fortunately, the object of her biggest affection, the Thai man promised to the wealthy businesswoman, moved away to Bangkok. During my various stints on the island, I met an array of foreign women, all with their reasons for being there. You had the young women exploring life and places on their gap years or post-university partiers, the Midlife Crisis Brigade, the Shirley Valentine divorcees, old and jaded women fed up with careers, with men in their life and with their existence. The biggest basket case of a woman I knew during my time was the owner of the dive shop managed by Amelia. Charlotte was an English woman in her mid-thirties, well-educated, articulate, and I imagine she would be considered interesting and attractive. Average height and weight, neither spectacular nor ugly. Since aged 18, Charlotte had suffered from a strong desire to travel and she had worked and lived in, far, in far-flung places. She had some training in nursing so that enabled her to find work where such services were sadly lacking. Charlotte also had partners with business interests in Thailand so she always had something to fall back on when she messed up. Charlotte was also a heavy drinker and had the tendency to tell stories of her adventures under the influence. I had gotten cornered into hearing many of these at our usual beach party hangouts. She had a taste for exotic men and rather odd maternal complex combined with a dubious white saviour mindset. So I figured that in less than 15 years, Charlotte has lived and worked in Spain, Egypt, Western Samoa, the Cooks, Solomon Islands, Papua New Guinea, and a few other places before arriving in Thailand around the turn of the century. In Samoa, she had an adulterous affair with the son of some village chief and she had to leave in a hurry. In Papua New Guinea, she was in a passionate relationship with a young man and found herself pregnant. She would show her colleagues and friends photos of herself happily posing with a pregnant bump with the love of her life. 
But beyond this, nobody really knew what had happened because depending on who she was talking to, she would say either A, realized things were not working out in this relationship and had an abortion, or B, her lover's family would not accept a white woman as part of their family and kicked her out and forced her to leave her child behind, or C, had a difficult and life-threatening miscarriage late in her pregnancy. Whatever the case, I knew Charlotte was a woman with lots of baggage. Sadly, her business experience was not much better than Amelia's and this dive shop was heading for failure. I left Thailand early 2005 and returned a year later and sure enough, the Charlotte Amelia project had gone under and they were blaming one another for the failure. Amelia was living in a hut with a 19 year old Thai boy who barely spoke English. Things got rough in their relationship when Amelia's parents visited and her teenage lover started flirting with her father a closeted bisexual. He left shortly afterwards, leaving Amelia in a real state, cursing him, her father, and every man she'd ever known. Charlotte, on the other hand, had managed to stay in a semi-long-term arrangement with her young Thai husband named Amon. He was handsome, charming, and had a very strong work ethic and spoke a reasonable amount of English. Behind his back, Charlotte would fantasize and tell her Western friends that she had taken Amon out of the jungle and had made him what he was and had taught him everything he knew. We all felt a bit sorry for Amon as Charlotte appeared extremely possessive, controlling and was behaving like some master imperialist. He was at her beck and call working day and night for whatever Charlotte had going work-wise. Amon's family, I was told, was proud as he was making good money and had a good standard of living better than anyone else in his family, so he quietly worked away being his charming self. So when Charlotte revealed to her friends and colleagues that she was a few months pregnant in mid-2005, all we could do was smile and wish both her and Amon the best. In spite of Charlotte's pregnancy and financial stability in her business, her relationship with Amon was rocky to say the least. She had suspected Amon of cheating on her and was nervous. In a very unfortunate turn of events, while she was eight months pregnant, she accidentally ate a cocktail of mushrooms and prescription medication and suffered a medical emergency. As a result, she had a miscarriage and a nervous breakdown. In my final months on the island, things were a bit too strange, so I kept a healthy arm's distance from the antics and dramas of others. Amon started seeing other women and for a while he ran away off the island. Right after the miscarriage, Char Charlotte found a small dog, a Maltese-type pup, and immediately, in her vulnerable state, took it as a surrogate for the child she'd lost and got extremely attached, not letting the dog out of her sight and carrying it around in a sling on her chest. I left the island in 2007 and didn't keep in touch with Charlotte, but I did stay in touch with Amelia, who stayed on the island until 2014. She was in a series of disa disastrous sounding relationships with Thai men, all young, not too educated and probably needed the money. According to her, Charlotte got back together with Amon after an on-off unsteady marriage where they both cheated with each other's and Charlotte's dog was still with her. So there you go guys, the first story read out on the channel from a female. Now uh, ladies, I know there's a lot of you out there listen to these stories, you like the stories, I, how do I know? Because I have a look in the back end of YouTube and I, it tells me how many guys have signed up to the channel, how many girls, and I know I've got nearly a thousand women subscribed. So if you are one of them and you've got a story similar to this, uh, I'd love to read it out on the channel. I, I, I always change names, you'll be totally anonymous you can send it in to my email address which is on my website is peter at thailand-bound.com uh, and i'll have a look at that and let you know and if i do read it out i'll email you uh, when i read it out all right so let's get into the second story i didn't tell you at the beginning there's actually three stories today and the last story i really like it's a real um we'll wait till we get to the third story let's get into the second one I'm from the UK and came out of a 17 year long toxic relationship in 2019. Myself and my partner at the time had spoken of visiting Thailand, but after we split up, I decided to take the plunge and take a trip to Thailand on my own. So at Christmas in 2019, I flew to Bangkok for what was originally meant to be a 10 day trip. 
I stayed in a rather lovely apartment hotel in Silom, which was very cheap and discovered that I would fall in love with Thailand within 24 hours. As a single man, having been cheated on multiple times throughout my long relationship, I very quickly discovered the wonders that Thailand can offer a sexually active, newly single man and found myself like a kid in a sweet shop. Even though I was in my late 40s, I had of course researched Thailand on the internet and thought I understood what it was all about, but discovered it was a hundred times better than I could ever imagine. Not just because of the beautiful women, but I fell in love with the culture, the people, the way of life, the weather of course, and just about everything connected to Thailand. Within two days, I had met a sweet and gorgeous girl called Nan, and also by chance bumped into three guys visiting from Scotland. These guys had been to Thailand many times and I spent the rest of my holiday hanging out with them. They taught me a lot about how everything works, the pitfalls and the delights on offer. I spent the next few days bar hopping and drinking more alcohol than I thought I could ever imagine doing, and then my new Scottish friends told me that they were traveling down to Pattaya which made me consider what I want to do for the rest of the holiday. While I enjoyed the company of Nan, who was now clearly more interested in one of my new friends, I didn't take it too seriously and I wanted to be a free spirit and decided that I would leave her behind and travel to Patia with my new friends. I felt really bad telling her I was going because she was a really sweet girl and she never asked for any money. In fact, she didn't have any money and bought her drink I bought her drinks and food everywhere we went. But at one point she received her salary and immediately paid for my night out, which I later discovered is very rare in Thailand. When I left Bangkok, I gave her some money and let her remain in my hotel when I had checked out early to head down to Pattaya. We have since stayed in touch and she now has a boyfriend and seems happy. I had decided to extend my stay for several days. I was spending a lot more money than I had planned on before leaving the UK. The problem being that I had now caught the Thailand bug, the kingdom can do that creeping up on you slowly. I discovered Pattaya was very different to Bangkok but for a single man has the same kind of beer bars and gogo bars which were brilliant and by the beach. I spent New Year's Eve in the bars and had a fantastic time for the remainder of my holiday. I would love to say that this was the best experience of my life and I suppose it was but it wasn't without a few bad experiences. My first bad experience was actually back in Bangkok. I was sitting in Soy 4 in the bars that are open to the street and drinking a cocktail jug that cost something like 200 baht. A great place to people watch as it is very busy and girls are everywhere. On the opposite side of the street, there was a girl sitting that kept looking at me, but I noticed that she was with a farang. So I didn't take much notice. The next thing I knew, she was sitting next to me and she started a conversation. It was obvious she wanted to have some fun, so I said, shall we go back to my hotel room for drinks together? The aerobics were great, and I went off to take a shower. At this point, it suddenly dawned on me that I was leaving myself vulnerable as my bag with my wallet and my money in it was in the room. I felt a little bit uneasy about this, so I jumped out of the shower without turning it off and immediately walked straight back into the room. And as I did so, I caught her holding my wallet above my bag and just about to pull all of the money out of it. What the hell do you think you're doing, I said. Like a seasoned professional, she answered, I'm looking for your passport. I'm not sure how that made it any better, but she seemed to have an answer for everything. At this point, I politely told her to get her stuff and leave. I then realized we were both butt naked and I suddenly felt quite vulnerable. Anyway, she put on her clothes and disappeared and I then realized that you have to be very careful in Thailand. After this experience, I am careful to leave my bag in view of both the shower and the room. My only other bad experience was while, was while I was in Pattaya. One evening, I decided not to crowd my new friends and spend the night on my own. So I took a BART bus over to Jump Tien's nightlife area to see what that was like. I met a local girl and invited her back to my hotel in Pattaya for drinks where we had some fun. Afterwards, I offered to pay for her taxi home and said how much would that cost? I have to admit, I was quite drunk, but when she said 1,000 baht, I assumed she was trying it on. Very funny, I said. It's not going to cost that much, and that's when the problem started. She started getting aggressive and vocal, so I resorted to filming her as I started to think I was being the victim to some sort of scam. 
I tried to remain calm as I didn't want to get involved in a dispute in Thailand, especially when I'm drunk and with a Thai local, especially if it was some sort of a scam. So I tried to lead her outside while still recording her on my phone. Her aggression got worse and then she did some sort of a flying kick at me, nearly knocking me over. Considering she was considerably smaller than me, it was quite worrying as I now thought, crap, I'm going to end up getting arrested for violence, even though I didn't react. Luckily, there were two Eastern European guys in the street who spoke both English and Thai, and I explained my problem to them. They also listened to the girl and then pointed out to me that on the way to my hotel, I didn't have change for the taxi, so she had paid for it, and I had promised to pay her back. This had completely slipped my mind, and although I didn't necessarily have to pay her taxi home, this would explain why she was asking for more money than one taxi trip. As I now understand this, I decided to give her 500 baht, and that seems to be sufficient, and she went on her way. Looking back, this was a good job because being as stubborn as I am, I wouldn't have given any money away since as I thought she was scamming me. I would have probably ended up in all sorts of trouble, especially as I thought she was going to claim she was charging me for her company and then I didn't pay her. It just goes to show you that sometimes the best solution is to stay calm and get an alternative opinion as being drunk can cloud your judgment. Anyway, after 14 days, I sadly had to leave Thailand looking forward to my next visit and then of course the pandemic hit. I've spent the last two years trying to arrange another trip to Thailand and even now I'm planning my retirement subject to a few enjoyable holidays to convince myself that is the way forward. Hopefully my next visit will be a little less problematic and as I now understand Thailand a lot better, hopefully easier to fit in. I have even started to learn the Thai language and although I'm not fluent, I could certainly hold a bit of a conversation in the usual sort of tourist environments and look forward to having it tested by Thai people who can teach me more. I have traveled to quite a few places in my time, including Hawaii, and none of them come close to the beauties and wonders that Thailand offers and I can't wait to return. Yeah, I mean, that seems to be a common factor with everybody who goes to Thailand for the first time. They've traveled to all sorts of uh, different countries around the world uh, and they think the fan paradise is on earth and then they get to Thailand and all that goes out the window. Uh, so quite interesting there. A little bit of a lesson to be learned, uh, you know, if you're new to Thailand, just, uh, you know, be extra cautious. It's very, very safe in Thailand. Uh, but obviously, if you're dealing, if you're going out in the entertainment areas, uh, you can meet all sorts of characters. So just keep your wits about you uh, and be very, very careful. OK, guys, so into our third and final story for today. Uh, it's another nostalgic one. This one goes back to 1968. And... I actually really enjoyed reading this. You know, I read these and edit them a little bit so they flow easier from me when I read them out to you. And uh, this is a great story, so I'm just going to crack on with it. It was 1968. I was only 19 years old and in the US Army when I received orders to go to Thailand. I really knew very little about Thailand other than it was in Southeast Asia and it was not Vietnam. And for that, I felt I was very fortunate. I arrived in Thailand via the Don Mong Airport. At that time, the Don Mong Airport was the main airport in Thailand. The following day was on an army bus heading to Karat. The road to Karat was being built by the US Army with the help of local workers. There were several sections of the highway that was still a dirt mud road. The very next day, I was in the back of an army jeep heading south to a small army base that was being built about two kilometers west of the Utapo Air Base. This is the same Utapo that is now an international airport, but in 1968, it was a military airbase where the B-52 bombers were stationed. Most of the GIs on the base listened to a military radio station that broadcast out of the Utapo base. It played typical 1960s rock and roll music. Within a day or two, I noticed that four or five times a day, the DJ would play a song like Will You Still Love Me Tomorrow and read off a series of numbers. 4, 28, 63, 67, etc. I kept thinking, what's up with the numbers? Is it some kind of a lottery? And if so, how do I buy some tickets? Is it the coordinates being broadcast for the B-52s on their bom bombing runs? So I asked one of the other GIs, what's up with the numbers? He said, 
Have you been down to town yet? I said that I had just arrived in the country less than a week ago and really had not had much time to get downtown. He said this Saturday some of us are going into town, come with us and we will show you about the numbers. We typically worked five and a half days a week. We would have off Saturday afternoon and all day on Sunday. Well, Saturday arrived and four or five of us went into town. There were maybe a dozen bars, a couple were listed as being off limits to military personnel. There were also several jewellery stores where you could buy souvenirs of Thailand. There were a few restaurants and a couple of tailor shops. We went into a bar and ordered a round of Singer beers. Oh my gosh, there were maybe a dozen gorgeous ladies in this bar. A few of them came over to our table. I never regarded myself as a really good looking guy, but these gorgeous young ladies all thought that I was a very handsome man. One of the ladies sat down next to me and began talking to me. She wanted to know if I had a girlfriend in Thailand. When I told her that I had just got into the country, she informed me that she could be my girlfriend. One of the other GIs pointed out to me that each lady wore a button with a number. He said, okay, the lady that you are talking to has a button with a number 57 on it. He said, each lady is tested once a week by the Air Force medics and it was not molded that they were test being tested for. He continued, if she tests positive, she is given a shot of penicillin, she cannot work for a week or two, and her number is read on the radio the following week. So if you take number 57 to a hotel tonight, and her number is read on the radio next week, you should consider going on sick call to be tested. If a bar refuses to have their ladies tested, that bar is put off limits to the GIs. I thought, what were the words from the movie Wizard of Oz? Something tells me we're not in Kansas anymore. Within several weeks, I became good friends with another GI. His name was John. To this day, I refer to him as my army brother. The two of us became friends with a local guy named Kitty Bun. He worked on the base. Kitty Bun lived in a small village about three or four kilometers from the camp. He would frequently invite us to his Thai house. John and I finally took, up, uh, took him up on the offer. Kitty Bun's Thai house was a small one room plywood shack. There was a light, a fan and a bed for sleeping. There also was no indoor plumbing. The first time I saw his Thai house, I was shocked that this was ha his home. However, after a few more visits, his Thai house began to, began to grow on me. It soon became our home away from home. We would go to his house, maybe sit on the floor and have some food and then head over to the local pool hall for a game of snooker. There was also a fresh fruit stand in the village. I would typically pick up some fruit to take back to the camp. In 1968, Patia was a small fishing village with a few bars and an excellent beach. It was maybe 25 or 30 kilometers north of where we were stationed. As I mentioned previously, we would typically have Saturday afternoon and all day Sunday off. John and I made numerous visits to Patia. You could take a taxi, but that would cost you maybe 40 or 50 baht. I do not know for sure because we never took the taxi. Being privates in the army, we did not make a lot of money and so we became a couple of cheap Charlies. We would go out to the Sukhumvit Highway and wait for the large blue bus that was heading to Bangkok. They ran approximately every 30 minutes. We would flag down the bus, pay 5 baht and 45 minutes later we would be at a gravel road that led down into Patia. The bus did not go into Patia, but stayed on the Sukhumvit Highway heading north to Bangkok. The bus could actually stop at two locations to get to Patia. I have no idea of exactly where these roads were, but I suspect that they are now the Patia South and the Patia North roads. We would typically get off at the South Road. Occasionally, there would be a taxi cab or BART bus sitting there waiting for a customer. If there was, we would take it down to the Beach Road. If not, we would walk. It was maybe a kilometre to the beach. The walk made that first beer taste that much better. There were a handful of bars in Patia, a snack bar and one or two hotels. There was no walking street. However, one of the bars that we would frequent was in the area of walking street. It was one of the few buildings on the beach side of Beach Road. I think its name was something like Friends Bar or Friendship Bar. Several of the ladies that worked at the bar actually lived in the rooms above the bar. There was another bar that we would frequent. I'm not sure of the name, but it was owned by a local named Cobb. We always referred to it as Cobb's Place. There was also an upscale bar connected to the Nipper Lodge, 
which was the highest hotel in Pattaya back then with six floors. Someone was renting motorbikes. You could rent a bike and drive up to Buddha Hill or just cruise up and down the beach road. There were also a few boys that would rent you a large inner tube for a half day that you could use as a raft for floating on the water. For several months, I rented a small apartment with no indoor plumbing in Pattaya for 100 baht a month. Whenever I hear a song by the Beach Boys, it takes me back to when I was a young kid chilling out in Pattaya, Thailand. Occasionally, we would get a three-day pass. When we did, we were on our way to Bangkok, as with Pattaya, you could take a taxi to Bangkok. However, it would cost maybe 150 or 200 baht. But that same bus that took us to Pattaya would continue on to Bangkok. It cost 15 baht and three hours later you would be pulling into Eggemeyer bus station in Bangkok. The Eggemeyer bus station still exists. If you're on the Sky Train today and are at the Nana station, the next stop is Asok. Three or four more stops heading south and you're at Eggemeyer. Bangkok in 1968-69 was a bit different than Bangkok in 2022. There was no Sky Train, no subway or overhead highways. There also were no high-rise buildings, no KFC, and believe it or not, no 7-Elevens. There were local buses, they cost 50 satang. 100 satang equals 1 baht. We would use the local Bangkok buses to navigate around the city. Most of the bars from 1969 have long since gone out of business. About the only one that I am aware of that is still there is the Thermae coffee shop. The Thermae is currently near Soy 13 on Sukhumvit. I do not remember where it was located back in 1969. There were several GI hotels along Sukhumvit and the new Pechaberry Road. They were all very similar. They were maybe five or six stories high and were air conditioned. They typically had an outdoor swimming pool and they had indoor plumbing and that was a treat. The price was typically 120 baht per night if you were a GI coming back from Vietnam. However, if you could speak Thai, you could get a room for 80 baht per night. There was a Mexican restaurant on Sukhumvit around Soy 25. I think that it was called the Nipper Hut. It was a great place for tacos. On several occasions, John and I would get a massage. On one occasion, we were getting massages in adjacent rooms. About halfway through the massage, John was not exactly pleased with his massage. He called to me through the paper thin walls and asked if I was still there. At the time, I was butt naked, face down on the table, and this young lady is walking on my back. Even though she weighed maybe 45 or 50 kilos, it was kind of restricting my breathing. I struggled to answer that I was still there. I'm not sure what he thought was happening in my room, owing to the fact that I was struggling with answering him. He then asked me how my massage was going. I started to answer that it was going good, but the young lady did not like me talking to the guy in the adjacent room. She pressed on her heel into my back and said, you know, speak with him. If you want to speak, you speak with me. I wanted to say, yes, ma'am. Whatever you say, but I could hardly breathe to talk. Then I thought, okay, if she asked me how many B-52s are, are at Utapal base, only give her your name, rank and serial number. As it turns out, I really did enjoy the massage, but I never went back to that establishment for another massage. In March 1969, Kitty Bun said that a special Thai festival, Songkran, was coming up in April. If we could get a short leave, we could go to Chiang Mai for the festival. To get to Chiang Mai, we would take a train from the Hua Lampong station in Bangkok. It took 17 hours to reach Chiang Mai. John and I were the only non-Thai people on the train. It felt like something out of a Hemingsway novel. The train was definitely third world. There were wooden benches for seats. The windows slid down into the sides of the railway cars. Occasionally, someone might board the train carrying a cage with two or three live chickens in it. At train stops, locals would board the train and try to sell a variety of food. Kitty Bun eventually became a Buddha monk. Not that he was super religious. It was a way to avoid the Thai draft. John and I were invited to his village up country for the ceremony. The village was in the north. It was very rural and the roads only extended out to a few of the surrounding villages. For most of the locals, we were the first Americans that they had ever seen. There was no indoor plumbing anywhere in the village. To take a bath, you would put on a sarong and head down to the river where you would remove the sarong and wade into the river and wash yourself. I think that half the village turned out to watch the two Americans giving themselves a bath. 
We were just glad that no one in the village owned a movie camera or regular camera. I spent two years in Thailand. While there, there were a couple of young ladies that touched my heart. But being so young and not sure where my life would leave once I left Thailand, the thought of marriage did not enter my mind. As it turns out, a couple of years after returning to the USA, I met the love of my life. We were married for 47 years before she died of an ongoing lung issue. In January 2020, I met up with John in Bangkok for a mini, mini reunion. My, how things had changed. We returned to the States just days before Thailand went, went into lockdown for the pandemic. If Thailand fully reopens, I would like to go back, maybe for an extended period of time. I suspect that this might be early 2023. While there, I would like to go up to the village where Kitty Byrne was from originally and see if there is anyone there that remembers him or his family. I suspect that there are family members who still live in the area. One of the things that I would like to do is to find him and tell him what a good friend he was to a young kid that was a thousand miles from home. There you go, guys. Wasn't that one of those uh, nice, nostalgic uh, stories? I like them kind of stories. Right. OK, so that's it for today, guys. Thank you very much for listening, as always. And I'll say the same thing that I always say when I end these stories. That is, the live stream is 9 p.m. this Friday. It'd be great if you could join me. And if you're not really into the live streams, then there'll be a bunch more stories next Saturday. Thanks again, guys. And I'll catch up with you all soon.